So tell me, tell me, Danielle Belton, who are you? Who are you? Oh. How'd you get here? Oh, well, it's a long story, but I'm going to okay, tell the short three, version. Okay, we got two hours. We're good. <laughs> We're good. Let's go. So yeah, so I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I've been a journalist since day one. Like, I was editor-in-chief of my college paper. That's like how I went hard into paint for the minute. Why? I could do, I love journalism. What? Tell me about it. Tell me I, why you love it. It's in my heart. So basically, I'm a nerd. My earliest memories is of watching the Iran-Contra hearings. <laughs> Watching Oliver North with my mom and dad. That is very interesting and different. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's very different. Yes, that's like one of my earliest memories. And my dad worked in the aerospace industry. Um, he worked for McDonnell Douglas, which built uh, fighter jets for the military. And I remember I was a very culturally aware kid. Like, I knew about the Cold War. I knew about fears about nuclear war. I knew about Ronald Reagan. I was aware of all these things when I was really, really little. And I had my first, like, crisis when I was around, like, I want to say like seven or eight years old, where I realized my Barbie dolls, the house I lived in, every comfort that I enjoyed in life was being paid for by war, essentially. Like, because, you know, Ronald Reagan just couldn't stop buying jets. Dick and, Cheney and daddy, just couldn't stop and coming. And daddy had a job. He had a great job. He had, he had a fantastic, you know, 30 plus year career as an engineer and later in management in the aerospace industry. And I'm like, I am benefiting from war and I want to understand this better. And the way I under got to understand it better was through reading the newspaper. It was through going to the library. It was through checking out books. It was through knowledge. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. All the things I was able to learn and to figure out how to reconcile these two things going on inside of me. Um, because my dad, my dad didn't vote for Reagan. My dad hated Reagan. You know, but he took like, that check. <laughs> he, he took that check though. Like, he didn't like Dick Cheney, but, you know, he was glad that he came and bought these jets, you know. And that was, like, the dichotomy that, you know, that, that was the contradiction that I had to live with. And so I was really curious from an early age about the world around me because of it. And journalism was the the entry point, the entryway that got me into it. And my parents, news junkies, so, you know, they watched both the 5 o'clock, the 5.30, and the 6 o'clock news. Wow. Like, it was just a whole solid hour and 30 minutes of news every night. So you're younger than I am. Walter Walter Cronkite was on it at 6 o'clock on, on CBS mm -hmm. in my home every 6 o'clock because we had one television. Actually, we had a bunch. Oh, my parents that. still only watch CBS okay. to this so, day. So who who were you watching at 6 o'clock? Oh, Dan Rather. Okay. Yeah, All it was right. Dan Rather. And so I grew up watching Dan Rather. I grew up watching 60 Minutes. My parents watched 60 Minutes religiously every Sunday. They got the Post-Dispatch, the local newspaper. And not only did they get the Post-Dispatch, they got the St. Louis American, which was the local black newspaper. They got both Ebony and Jet and Essence. And when BET had their little magazines, like when they had Emerge and YSB, they got those for me too. So like I was surrounded by news and knowledge and information. I love the written word so much. Like, I was a voracious reader as a child. Like, I got every book that I could get a hand on. I read so many things that I probably shouldn't have been reading as a child. That Judy to Bloom? This... What were you reading? Judy Bloom, Judy Krantz? I was reading, like, Civil War, like... Oh, okay. You, you were on something else. Anthology. I was okay, never mind. <laughs> no. Succubus, Incubus, Stephen no, King. No, like, I was right, reading about my... <laughs> war and politics. Okay, all like right. A crazy yeah, that, yeah, so you were really, really... I was hardcore. Yes. Okay, so as we now look around... Because yes. I teach journalism and I, st I tell my students, mm -hmm. journalism is dead. It's dead. It's gone. Do you feel the same way, Danielle Belton? I don't feel like it's dead. I feel like we're in this <laughs> weird time um, where there's so much information that it's easy to dispense disinformation. It's easy to disguise garbage amongst the real kernels of truth that exist. So you have to be a really aware, selective reader in a way that you didn't have to be in the past. And the reality is in the history of journalism, like tabloids and sensationalism and misinformation were always a problem in journalism. You can go back to some of the earliest newspapers and, you know, for whether it was the, you know, yellow journalism with, with the Spanish American war, you can go back even further that to the, you know, the colonial days of misinformation around the revolutionary war. Like there's always been this, it's always been a part of us. It's who we are. So the difference is people, it's just more of it. More susceptible, more susceptible because we don't read as a culture, as a as a as Americans. We don't. I would argue we've always been this. I mean, the Spanish American War literally happened because a bunch of newspapers ginned up and coined a, the term "yellow journalism" was coined from it. Like, oh, literal war happened based on misinformation in newspapers, and that was the turn of the century when that happened. Okay, so we're in a pendulum swing right now. Yeah, we're just like there was a period where. Journalism became like um, 
a real profession as like because historically it was a blue collar job like you just got a job at a newspaper you got a job at a radio station you know right out of high school they trained you you went out in the world did what you had to do then you get to the advent of television and television networks creating news divisions as like as a public service and so now suddenly it's a, like a real job. You have newspapers that have all this money they're getting from the classified sections so they can pay real salaries. So it becomes a college educated profession. And so you have all these college educated people. They take the profession really seriously. You know, they're really educated on uh, ethics and how to properly uh, dismiss stories. And so you go through this golden era, which is what you're referring to when you're talking about Walter Cronkite and the individuals like that, where this, like, if Walter Cronkite said it, you knew it was true. You could trust, you know, the CBS News brand back then it, to the point where my parents still have brand loyalty to this day because it was that big. And what ends up happening is, is that TV news had to become profitable after the advent of cable television and CNN, where suddenly it was like, wait, now the news division needs to make money. Historically, the news division didn't need to make money. And then you have the Internet comes along and classified ads become Craigslist. It basically puts all the newspapers out of business. So that's what killed the golden era wow. of journalism. Business and technology. <laughs> yes. So, so can we get it back? And what does that look like? Because, again, I, I, I can't sit and be okay with the level of ignorance that seems to be running rampant because I feel like we're, like, literally, that World War Z. You know that scene where the zombies are coming up the wall? I feel like we're being overrun by ignorance to the point where it's uh it, we we are going to be drowned in it. No, I mean this is a constant war that I feel like people like us have been fighting throughout the centuries. Like it's it's never going to end. So like as long like as there are people and people are <laughs> f full of fail, people are full of despair, people make terrible decisions, you know, there's, and in American society, there's a huge strain of anti-intellectualism where why people that? really celebrate Why ignorance. is that? Uh, how, do, how? Why? Why would you want to? <laughs> I don't understand that. Help me. I want, you know, it's, it's, some of it's about a rejection of modernism and science. Uh, some of it okay. has to do <laughs> with the idea that educated people seem, you know, uppity and aloof. And so you don't like them. you think I'm you think you're better than yeah I am better because I read more. <laughs> Hello eight six six eight zero one eight two. Let's come. Let's do this. <laughs> Prove me wrong. And this you can get better though. No. So here's the thing. I may be better, but you can catch up. Like what? you don't have to sit in your ignorance. No people it's are fixable. very happy with their ignorance. The thing is, with um, there's a difference between someone who just doesn't know and someone who's like stupid. Um, which I hate you know using that word, but. Essentially, it boils down to people who are smart know they don't know everything. People who are stupid are think that they are they think they already have it all figured out. They don't need to learn anything else. Oh, and so that's what you're up against. You're up it's against a, a lot kind of, of that. <laughs> you're up against a kind of like proud ignorance. <laughs> 